Washington. Got it. So, hello, Future Cannabis Project. Uh, we're going to start a little bit early tonight because I don't know how time zone works. It's just where I'm from. Anyway, we've got our good friend Matthew Gates from Zen Zenthanol, right? I'm saying that right, Matthew? Yeah, Zenthanol Consulting. Uh, Matthew is a wicked bug guy, etnologist, ethnomologist. I never know if I'm saying that word right. But what uh, we're going to do today is just have a really quick uh, peek at Matt's uh, Instagrams. And for anybody that's triggered by insects and garden problems, now is your warning. Uh, this is a trigger warning. I am triggered off of Matthew's Instagram page all the time. And uh, it's fine, but brings back horrible, horrible memories. So let's add to the stage. And Matt, I don't know, like you've been on Future Cannabis so much. Do you want to introduce yourself again for the 5,000th time? It's probably worth it. Okay. It's probably worth it. Yeah. So although I have been on the on this and other podcasts in the cannabis space quite a bit, for those who don't know, my name is Matthew Gates, and my personal account here is uh, Sync Angel, at Sync Angel on Instagram. But you can check me out if you have professional needs, if you require some pest assistance, some IPM guidance, things like that. And you can check me out at xenthanol.com as well. But to be honest, because we live in the future, a lot of people do contact me for work through social media. So, you know, if that's how you want to do it, that's fine as well. But yeah, and uh, I did make a, a couple of cool posts that we can check into um, today. Now I can't hear you. That's because I new mic. Sorry, man. Uh, no problem. <laughs> Normally I mute myself and somebody else is talking so that there isn't feedback. So um so is it uh your business page or did you upload them on this one? Oh, it's on this one. This okay. is the one where I put most of my content because there's just oh. more people. And uh yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay. So these are mold mites. Now, you want to talk about this? Oh, it didn't even show up. Why didn't it show up? Oh, is it that slow? Yeah. Is no, it I like clicked. popped up? Okay. Yeah, it should, it should just pop right up. Right? I've done that. I did this last week uh, with Colin from Crop King here. Let me just retry this. Can you share on your mm -hmm. side? You see at the very bottom there? There's a uh, share. There we go. I got it. There we it. go. Okay, so mold mites. Tell me about these little gross things. Yeah, so a lot of people get through or come across these at some point or another. Um, they're generally not a problem for the most part. I usually like to start off by saying that because the number of people, this is like on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol. I get this question all the time, like, what are these things? And they're either mold mites like these, or they might be springtails, or they might be some kind of soil predatory mite, uh, which for a lot of people, if they've never really grown anything, any plants before, um, then they might only really think of them as some sort of detrimental thing because they don't know what they're looking at. And also for some people, they're still going to be a nuisance and they still want to control them, which is totally valid. But generally, uh, I wouldn't consider them a huge issue. And I would say that for those who do want to deal with them, though, there's a few ways that you can. One thing to know is that they're kind of ubiquitous, these mold mites. You can kind of tell them. There's another video we can go over that I posted recently that shows a difference between uh, these and, like, predatory mites. Yeah, it's that one right there. So you can kind of see that there's a pretty big difference. If you just look, if you've never seen these before, these images before, you can kind of already tell, right? Like this thing is moving kind of quickly. It's got two front legs. They almost look like antennae, but they're not, but they use them this way. Um, these are predatory mites in the soil. And a lot of times they're not just carnivorous. You know, they'll go after like some spores of some fungi or something like that. So 
Yeah, that that is um, one way you can tell the difference is that they're a lot quicker, they're a lot speedier, and they kind of have a different shape. They're a little bit smoother, too, if you get a good microscopic look, like the person who sent this video to me uh, obviously did. So compared to those, you can see that mold mites are kind of lumbering, meandering. Uh, they're a little hairier, right? You can kind of you can kind of see it in this video that they have these uh, these longer hairs that kind of come out of their body at oblique angles, and they have this sort of bulbous shape, whereas the other ones are a little bit more like teardrop shaped, right? You know, that's how I describe it here in the post. And I think that's generally true. The, the predators, although you won't be able to tell too well, um, they have these calissary mouth parts that kind of would be like, if you look at like a teardrop shape, um, I think that's kind of the point of the teardrop, whereas the base of the teardrop is the abdomen or the, the base of the that makes sense. If you superimpose, you know, those images together, if you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, we got a question from Jeff in the comments here. What exactly are these predatory mites eating? Yeah, good question. So they're not a huge issue. Um, they're not issue, the issue at all, the predators. Some of the things that they'll go after are like springtails, which are themselves not really a huge issue. But Depending on the species, they might also go after things like fungus gnats, uh, specifically their larvae, not really the adults so much, and maybe the puparia too. So the in-between stage between larva and adult. We'll go after um, uh, some thrips pupae, or well, thrips don't really have pupae, but people like to say that anyways. They have this sort of, um, if people have dealt with thrips before, they have probably seen the flyers, the adults that are kind of slender shaped with wings. And then they have a, a larval form that looks just like the adult, but without wings. And then there's this so-called quiescent stage where they kind of stop moving, kind of like a pupa or a cocoon, you know, of other insects. They don't really have that. They don't descend from that lineage that has them. But anyways, it works the same way. They kind of stop moving. They stop feeding. They fall to the substrate or the floor. And a wandering predatory mite that's feeling kind of peckish uh, will definitely go after them. And that's those are the two big ones that commercial biocontrol companies are going to use or are going to um, you know, suggest people to use. And I've also used them in this capacity too. Those are some. Those are two big ones. There are some other. Uh, flies and things kind of like fungus gnats, like shore flies, that have a similar sort of, you know, pro profile of, of what they go after. But yeah, those are the those are the big things that they go after, and mold mites too. That's the other thing. So you might see them together, which is why they can be confused for each other. Right? Yeah. I could totally see somebody confusing the two if they've yeah. never seen these before. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, they, the only difference I'm seeing is that the mold mites like to kind of get into a group. And yes. like, am I accurate yeah. there? Yeah, so if you see a group, those are mold mites. If you see one running around on his own, it's one of these. Yeah, and so certainly you can see a bunch of, um, of these predator mites together. But yeah, the mold mites, you know, they're going to be attracted generally, like I say in the post, um, excess organic matter and excess moisture, they're really going to like that. Other organisms will too, like springtails, but these mites are mostly looking for like organic matter to chew on. And in that way, they can be great because they break down the organic matter and they pass it and that sort of a thing. So there are, there are certainly benefits that can be there for mold mites. But like you say, they sort of congregate. They find some like decaying leaf or fruit or whatever. And you can see right away that they'll just, they'll feed, they'll reproduce, and they'll make more of themselves and all kind of concentrate in one place. And similar sort of behavior with other pest mites are like that too, like herbivorous spider mites and things. They're, they basically, they're not looking for prey. They're already on their food source. So they're going to sort of congregate there. And that's a, that's a really great um, sort of rule of thumb that you can use against them and to sort of tell the difference. Nice. This is like I like I told you last week. This stuff triggers me. Um, for I'm primarily an indoor grower and have been for years. So, 
you know, no knock to the organic community. I love what you guys do. I just can't. Organics means more bucks. <laughs> and I don't want to fight against that. Um, so what else do you have for us here, Matthew? What is, you know, I saw the caterpillar this video. Yeah. yeah. People seem to think that one. Yeah. Yeah. This one was interesting this week. So I found these on a friend's uh, basil plant. And uh, they just wrecked, it, they skeletonized the crud out of this basil plant. And we thought we got all of them actually, but in fact, uh, when I visited them a few days later, they, they still had some more. And, and we knew they were for, probably from the same like litter, <laughs> the same batch uh, that was left by the moth that, uh, that brought them or butterfly because they were, it was about the same size, about the same age of the, of the other one. And, and yeah, these are not like the budworms that I often talk about. These are, maybe they're inchworms, maybe they're geometrids. It's hard to really tell at this stage, like caterpillars can look very similar to each other. But they are probably not going to bore into your buds. They're probably going to feed on the leaves um, kind of by themselves. And the damage that's associated is chewing kind of damage. So I said skeletonized before. Uh, have you ever seen leaves like that, Damon? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 These things are cool though. <laughs> we got comments. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I really liked it. I think the music goes really well too, though, though no pressure to add it because I know we might get it might nope. be loud nope. or who knows what. No nope. content uh, strike. Not gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, good idea. That's another great yeah. reason not to. Yeah. Um, I've been I'm in Peter's good graces and I would like to keep it that way. Yeah, I, I'm here with you um, with the way that videos are, especially on YouTube lately. Um, that is the, the better part of Valor. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, you can see that um, the caterpillars, a lot of caterpillars are actually cannibalistic. If, they, um, if they're hungry or there's not a whole lot of food for them, or for whatever reason, they might eat their, uh, their siblings, potentially, or, or another, another group. Um, if they're kind of low on food. So you can see that these guys, they don't really, not really um, not attacking each other, but they they, uh, they don't have a whole lot of uh, camaraderie, you know, as they're moving away from each other. Yeah, they're definitely not friends. Um, just going back to the mites here, uh, do they bite? Can yeah, they bite? good question. I saw that in the chat. Um, no, they don't bite as far as I'm aware. Although... There are mites that are similar to these, like uh, like dust mites, for example. And certainly another reason you might want to treat them is like in a home grow setting, maybe not in a commercial setting as much, but in a home grow setting, you might have yourself, you might have allergies to these kinds of organisms. They might get out of your grow space and they might go and infest some food that you've left out. Um, I've seen, probably, I don't typically see this happen, but it's certainly plausible and some people could be affected by them in the same way they might be affected by the dust mite. And also I've seen them get into food, like pet food, for example, that gets left out, like dry pet food, especially. Um, so if you're like growing and you're like growing in like a shed and or, or somewhere attached to like a garage or somewhere where you might also hold this food, then um, that could be an issue, certainly. So there's reasons to get rid of them, but generally, uh, a lot of times I feel like there's it's not worth the the effort and labor, and people will panic when they see them and don't realize the correct threat level that they might have. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's like I said, I love you as a friend, but all the knowledge that you have scares me because <laughs> yeah, old people like me bugs were bad right like and the the generation before me the way they used to deal with bugs was oh, yeah. uh, sprite <laughs> spraying sprite on your plant and like it just so yeah yeah <laughs> okay what do we got next matthew let's see oh whoops at the stage there we go um you sure like your dragon ball z eh Oh yeah, you know you would, get, um, you would get along well with my best friend. <laughs> yeah, growing yeah. up, you know, there was a lot of that 
the, a lot of that on the right at the right time. The zeitgeist, man, I don't think it would work. I mean, life would probably be a little bit different for certain people if that were the case. But yeah, there's just a lot of, um, you know, a lot of Japanese media loves to use insect-like iconography. So it worked out, you know, uh, oh, wow. especially that Imperfect Cell video that you had out there. Um, you know, like, uh, yeah, you can make you can make jokes. And certainly people like Team Four Star did. Um, <laughs> let's do the... Uh, Let's <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the, the puparia, right? So so somebody asked me what this could be, and I was pretty sure. Um I didn't I didn't get to see an adult uh, follow-up picture, but I'm pretty sure this is some kind of um what I say here, a muscomorph or a muscomorph fly puparium. So yeah, that's what they look like. Um a lot of flies have like there's two main lineages of flies. There's tons of flies out there. But most people, I think, when they when they envision a fly, they might think of something close to a green bottle fly or a house fly that has that sort of stout, that like short, yeah, that sort of the head like here that's kind of like small, big eyes, a lot of hairs all over its body that are short and kind of stout rather than being kind of long and, and more, um, I don't know what the right terminology would be. But yeah, a lot of a lot of flies fit into this category of muscomorph. Like fruit flies, for example, are like this. Or leaf miner flies are like this. They have that same general body. And when they develop into a pupa, that's what they look like. That's what the puparium of, of these kinds of flies look like. So that's why I was pretty reasonably sure. Even if I don't know the species, I can still use context cues, and physiological cues to make a reasonable guess. And the larvae look different. The other type of fly is what like fungus gnats look like, for example, or crane flies look like. They have this long, uh, first of all, their larvae have like a, a head capsule that's actually like hard, kind of like a caterpillar. So um, other, unlike the flies that we think of that their larvae are what we might think of as like maggots, right? Where they have like no discernible like head for the most part, they might move in one direction or another direction, like fruit fly maggots or house fly maggots or that kind of thing. They might be tapered on one end. So they're at, that's actually the derivative group. The older, more ancient lineage is like the fungus nest, a thin body, kind of a dainty flyer, um, and the larvae have an actual head, whereas the other ones, they kind of lost that. I guess they didn't need it. Nice, nice. What else, Matthew? Let's uh, let me pick one. Let's go deep into your. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is one of them. Yeah, explain what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, this is a. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is some kind of tiger moth, probably the Virginia tiger moth caterpillar. And you can see I've made a video about these and uh, similar species. They like to congregate when they're uh, on a plant. And as we see more research about cannabis pests, we'll, we'll see more and more information, um, you know, regarding uh, what goes what goes on them, what goes on cannabis plants, and what you know whether they're like a huge problem or not. Because some of these pests, you know, they're kind of they are low level. They are actually not a huge issue. Um, it's not just a selling point for somebody to just say, hey, you know, no pests are a problem, buy my book. <laughs> but uh, these ones in particular, they can skeletonize leaves, sure. But um, if you catch them early, it's not really going to be a huge issue, to be honest. So that's why crop scouting is so important, because you can really, I mean, you could just kill all of these just by, you know, crushing the leaf because you found them early enough. Yeah. And uh, shout out to Colin. He's a great guy. I had him on here a couple of weeks ago and uh, his best advice that he can give to people is, you know, doing the monitoring every day, you know, walking the crops, walking the rows, checking all the leaves. And, you know, it's not boring, not for weed people. It's actually kind of fun. So let me pick another one here. Ooh, right here. <laughs> what are we looking at? Yeah, so this is a jewel spider. Um, do they do they bite? Not really. I mean, what do you 
when you ask this question of somebody who knows a thing or three <laughs> about bugs, you know, like what do you mean by that? Could they conceivably bite a human? Sure, maybe. Okay, but like, how likely is that? Is so low because they're orb weavers. Even if you were to like go through their web, uh, they don't like defensively bite really. And even if you were to try to make them bite you somehow like there's a few youtubers out there and, and other folks who um they've amassed quite a following because they literally will like incite like a stinging wasp or a venomous spider to like bite them and some of these are really hard to actually make do that because uh well venom is really costly and they need that to subdue their prey so like if they don't know what's going on, like they don't necessarily do that. Now, not all spiders are like this, uh, but we tend to catastrophize. And I think that's unfortunate because it causes people to kill things like this without maybe needing to. Um, but, you know, uh, sometimes it's uh, it's a necessary thing. But, you know, a lot of wasps and other organisms will, will take them out. So you don't have to necessarily do that. I agree with Dirty. <laughs> Matthew's page is... It's triggering. Um, so we've got actually a really good question in the comments here. Uh, and, I, you know, we can bring this up. So let's talk about how to deal with spider mites, which is my problem. Uh, on and off for eight months because they are crafty. <laughs> I think they are dead. Then a few months later. So this is something I've ran into over the years. Um I have my way that I deal with it, which is probably not the safest thing on the planet, but it works. Matt, what would you say uh, to, you know, the end all to get rid of spider mites? And I don't use pesticides. Yeah, so, I mean, first, I think I can't answer your question because there's no such thing as like an end, be all, end all. Everyone's context is a little different. So I'll push back a little bit on the premise, but... Okay. I know what you're asking. How, what do we? What do we do? What do we do when we get rid of them, or how to get rid of them? There's a few things you can do. Um, one thing that you can do, like some people I see in the comments are saying, uh, is that you want to be very careful about like keeping the problem from being an issue in the first place. Um, you know, not to like obviously this person's already dealing with them, so maybe that feels like the horses have left the barn <laughs> already. Uh, but that is the case. That is the first thing I'll say is that crop scouting, like you said, is so important. And knowing what the science of them is, you know, before they start webbing up your plants and that kind of thing. If you have uh, house plants, if you take and bring produce into your house, if you, or other sorts of things like flowers or whatever, um, if you have plants on your property, like in a home grow setting, actually, even in a commercial grow, um, uh, it's more commonly than I would have hoped to be the case. I've had to tell people like, hey, I know that you own a greenhouse and that's cool and everything, but you really shouldn't be bringing your pet plants in to like grow them because you're, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we found spider mites on them and now your whole crop has them. And that's, that's your fault. <laughs> you know what I mean? You probably shouldn't have done that. Um, but yeah, that can also happen in a home grow setting. You know, you have some nice plants outside in the backyard something like that. So that's one thing you can do. But also my favorite thing to use are predatory mites actually, uh, for similar mites for my fave. But you have to implement them right. And uh, I don't want to be too garrulous, but I do have some videos on my channel that go over some of these techniques you can use. There's various ones out there, other predatory mites. There's a special lady beetle that goes after spider mites, believe it or not, Stethoris punctillum. Um, there are some flies like uh, a carasuga, a feltiella carasuga that goes after them. The larvae will feed on them. Don't get a lot of opportunities to use those two, but um, there are biocontrol companies out there that sell them. And if you wanted to try something different, you certainly could. There might be some advantages to using them or a mixture of them. Awesome. Now, uh, what type of predatory insects, aside from ladybugs, can somebody look at getting to deal with the spider mites? And then the second part is, is where are the eggs located? Do they nest in the plant or are they nesting in the soil? 
Well, actually, most Lady Beetles, I would not say, are for spider mites. But the specific one I mentioned, uh, you could get... I just want to mention that because that's also a common misconception. People buy Lady Beetles and be like, it'll kill all my pests. And maybe it'll get rid of your aphids, maybe. But there's issues with using them, too. But regardless, Persimilis mites, big one. They're red. Uh, a lot of companies have them. And it's easy to apply them. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, other things, you asked other products that can use other biocontrols? Yeah. Yeah. So there's Felatiel Arcarasuga, the spider might fly that you can use. Do um, What about lace, lace wings? They, they will, they're generalist predators. They will go after um, spider mites. Uh, they do. And there's some other predatory mites like Swirskia and Cucumers that have been shown in research to, like, they'll, they'll feed on some, especially if there's no other alternative prey. But it's like, um, you know, to use, a, uh, to use a video game term, they're not like a hard counter. You know what I mean? They're not like a, they're not something I would rely on. You know, if you already have them in your garden for other reasons, then they might have a little spillover effect. You know, but for similis, they only go after spider mites. So, what would you suggest? Like the the comment down below for a spray. Like, do you well, have any sprays that you would recommend? I try not to recommend sprays without knowing the context better. Um, if I'm being intellectually honest, sometimes I do mention things out there, but I have no idea the context of the person's situation. Yeah. So I don't know where they are at or if they can actually acquire them um, or if they're you know, acquirable uh, for them. And for spider mice in particular, like, uh, you know, if you're if you're in flower versus veg, that's really important to know because there's some products you might use. Like, for example, as a general like mitocidal insecticidal product, a lot of people are familiar with uh, wettable sulfur, not burnable sulfur, but wettable sulfur or micronized sulfur. Really cheap. Um, you can apply it readily. I wouldn't apply it in flour, but I would apply it in veg, and, and it would go after. It would it would damage the spider mites, but it could also damage uh, other insects, other predatory mites you might have there as well. Uh, and also fungi that you might apply um, to the foliage potentially. So you got to be careful in the implementation. Nice, nice. You also don't well, want to burn your plants. <laughs> you you've got to leave, and so I did. I did enjoy the quick conversation that we had. Oh no, your 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 uh, uh, your timing is off. It is uh, nineteen hundred seven p.m. right now for me. <laughs> I told you, fucking time zones, and I was all worried here. <laughs> yeah. We're good okay. to go for a little okay. more. If you are, I am. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. All right. I'm not All on right. as much of a timeline as I thought. Um, okay. But I, I appreciate that you were willing to do that small amount just well, for yeah. me because you thought yeah. so. so. Thank you. Well, we, got, we got science out there. That's the whole idea. Are you drinking sake? <laughs> no. no I actually really problem. don't like rice wine, uh, rice liquor. <laughs> I... No. um. Uh, so I lived in China for two years, uh, and over there, a very popular drink is called baijiu. Baijiu literally translates as white wine, but it's really like uh, really like sake. It's really like kerosene, actually. If you ever drink kerosene or like no. uh, butane, no. you know, like propane, yeah, like <laughs> it tastes like it tastes gross. It tastes really bad, and uh, you know, one of the most masculine things you can do over there is like eat a lot of like meaty fatty food and then drink a bunch of baijiu um you know that's like the that's like the you know like the cigars and a martini uh, over there at least that was my experience so drinking culture is different this is deep uh, okay yep. thank you for the alcohol lesson no i don't want to drink propane or propane no. accessories no kerosene yeah <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Back, back to bugs here. Uh, we'll click that. No, that's not the right one. Shout out to Chad Westport, by the way, Chad, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I like it when you come, hopefully maybe one day you and I can collab on something, but moving on. Okay. What exactly am I looking at here without reading the captions? Awesome. Yeah. So the, it's so, so this is a, it is a stink bug, but it's not a pest stink bug. So one of the things that 
I like to offer to people is this more discreet, especially people who I really vibe with people who they don't want to like kill things unnecessarily, especially from like an ecological standpoint. You might also target things that, first of all, you don't want to spend the extra time or money, right? Like, you know, you don't want to like attack it. Like with the mold mites, like if they're a problem for you specifically, that's totally valid. If, but if they're not, who cares? Right, like, like then don't spend the the, the resources, uh, the worry, the concern, the time, the money, the energy. But these stink bugs are predatory, not herbivorous, and there are stink bugs like this. So I like to offer the ability for people to know the difference. You can kind of tell the difference here. Um, so the stink bugs, not all of them are like this, but a lot of them are like this, where they have some traits. Uh, like having spiny shoulders, as you can see. Um, and they also have a what's called the, the rostrum or the beak, sort of that proboscis looking uh, thing that like for stink bugs that are herbivorous, they stick into the plant. But maybe unsurprisingly, if you're going to stick it into the armored body of another bug, then you have to have a more robust rostrum. So you will notice that they have a thicker uh, beak, and that is for that reason. So it's armor piercing. And, they, and the stink bugs, like the brown marmaid stink bug and similar ones, they don't have these spikes. And also you can tell for the eggs, which I think might be also in the video, um, the eggs for stink bugs that are predatory, like the soldier bug, they have like spikes around the eggs. Yeah, you can see that right here. So you can see the those, thick... Those are cool. <laughs> yeah, right. They look kind of cool, right? Yeah, so so they have this like spiky appearance, which is pretty obvious to tell. Where are these found like naturally? Like what in what location in the world would you find these things? Well, these aren't my pictures, uh, but the soldier bug is th these one the ones right here, Podiceus or Podiesis, I forget. Um, yeah, Podiesis. They they're uh, in North America. I think they're in other places too, but I think these ones in particular are generally from uh, sort of North America region. I have never seen one in Saskatchewan. Yeah, and, and also in my experience, they're pretty rare. For me, for, in my experience, I don't I don't encounter them <coughs> in, in the field, but they are there. And I, you know, I generally live in Southern California unless I'm out traveling. So, right, everyone else's situation might be a little different. I feel like they might be more common uh, closer to the Midwest or East Coast, though. So if you're in that area in North America, yeah, you can probably more likely see them. Uh, stink bugs, for example, that aren't a problem, they don't have the, the spikes, the little um, spiky hairs at the top. They look like a, a cluster. It's kind of pretty, too. It's got this sort of hexagonal shape to it if, if anyone's ever seen those before you know kind of like this but a little bit more put together and uh yeah so brown marmaid stink bug from asia huge problem da, da, da. <laughs> this is a this is a joke um, oh okay this is, this is a, <laughs> these don't these don't go after your plants right yeah so this is a but this is a um this is an isopod like the um Roly polies and sow bugs, and things that people will encounter. This is its cousin from the benthic ocean. They get pretty massive, actually. And yeah, so this is a marine organism. <laughs> That's huge. Um, so I've got a question. Uh, just speaking about Saskatchewan and where I'm at, we have uh, box elder beetles, uh, maple box bugs. Box elder bugs, yeah. Yeah, maple bugs is what we call them locally. How do you stop these things from wanting to come into your house in the fall? Yeah, uh, you know, the biggest thing you could do is probably, I mean, it sounds obvious when I say it, but like, you gotta, you gotta control those crevices. Another thing for people, and even for myself, I sometimes forget, but like a lot of people have like a two door situation, right? They have like an in, like they have like at the front of their house, they'll have like an exterior door. A storm right? door. Yeah. Like, a storm door. Yeah. And, exactly. then, and then the actual door. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so you can get this sort of like uh, airlock phenomenon where, right, where like you open the front door, maybe you leave it open for whatever reason, but the, the internal door is so closed. It might be a screen door. And then some bug or whatever, a fly will like land in and around there. You will close that front door and then open the other door or vice versa. You'll open that door up and then they'll, they'll come in and then you'll close the door behind them. So being aware of that kind of thing can be useful, uh, but but really sealing the cracks and crevices and making sure that sort of thing is um, ship shape is probably the best thing that I could say. Stink bugs are like that too. They like to come in, um, they sense the heat, and they want to be uh, they want to be there, especially when the, the seasons change. But to be honest, those box elder bugs, I think we were talking about it last time we spoke. Um, they're usually not a huge issue unless you're dealing with uh, those soapberry plants so if you see them yeah. on your other plants they're not really concerned with them they just want to be there because it's green <laughs> yeah 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 no they they're just annoying because they like all huddle they up at the corner of where my garage door opens and like you open it a little bit and there's thousands of them in there yeah um, and like they'll, they'll probably congregate around lights and things like that too right yeah so you get the shop back out and vacuum them out and then go okay guys go outside right? i'm a fan of not killing things if you don't have to and uh it's well known that if like when you when you you know terminate uh and squish the bug all of a sudden there's more because of a pheromone that's left off am i right yeah yeah, I think so. Yeah, like an alarm yeah. compound. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, Bugs oh, cool. well, that's not good. Yeah. They're, they're like, they're little engineers, in my opinion. Um, I think that's, they need a, what they need is they need a, a new agent. They need an agent really badly yeah. because yeah. they're like 90% of the mass of animals on Earth. And so if we kill a bunch of them, you know, we're really going to screw up the environment. <laughs> I don't know where I heard this, but for every human on Earth, there is one billion bugs. Hmm. One billion Maybe. insects. I can't I don't know what they mean by bugs. That could be. That could be. Yeah. That could be yeah. closer to the truth, even with that such a big number. Yeah. No, it's it's yeah. insane, right? Okay. Next, I want to talk about dragonflies. Teach me about. Okay, dragonflies. one of my favorites. Mine too. Oh, big dragonfly got, guy. Big you got show and tell here. Let me put. Let me bring it back. Oh no, we want. No, we got it. I got it. Big yeah. dragonfly. Okay. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Put it, and if you know what that logo is, put it in the chat. If you recognize that logo, put it in the chat. Uh, Intrepid wants to say hi to you too, Matt. Hello, hey Intrepid. <laughs> So uh, dragonflies, right? One of yeah. my favorites. Actually, I felt bad because uh, when I was asked, when Lyndon asked me what my favorite was, I often say dragonflies are my favorite, but I always think of uh, wasps too. They're kind of like neck and neck because they're like aerial uh, predators that are like really good at what they do. So dragonflies are probably the, they're probably the goat. They're probably the top predator as far as like success rate. I guess if you were to if you were to look at it that way, they're probably maybe the best. Um, and there's a lot of adaptations that they have, and I'm explaining in this video those exact uh, adaptations. Basically, their wings have a bunch of nerve connections and uh, different sensory nerves that allow them to like really sophisticatedly feel the air around them, and so they can make all these really elaborate jinking moment mo movements or banking movements uh, combined with their eyes, which are just filled with what are called omatidia, which is like their little uh, eye segment, you know? So they don't have, we have one lens for our eye. But they have many uh, things just like lenses as the compound eye, right? So they have really good vision for insects and they fly really good and they're very fast. And those things together allow them to be really good at what they do. So, and this research report goes over it. They have some really cool, sorry for the mic strike. They have some really cool uh, visuals. So I just thought uh, a voiceover was needed. Yeah, they can barrel roll too, right? 
<laughs> uh, maybe. I bet they could. I bet they could. They really were pressed to do it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I wasn't... Maybe you have to press B. We used to have lots of dragonflies, and now they're all gone. We have lots of lace wings, though. The dragonflies were really cool to watch. Climate change. Anyway. <laughs> Dragonflies are really ancient too. That's the other cool thing about them, because um, yes. they they've been around a long time. And some a, a similar organism before them called griffin flies also existed that were lar larger. They had like a meter long wingspan almost. If you can believe. Oh. But then birds evolved, and uh, they were better. <laughs> so a hoverfly. Yeah. Is that what this is? I thought it was. Yeah, hoverflies. Hoverflies are slept on, um, as far as biocontrollers are concerned. They so for, again for the initiated, they look a lot like a bee or a wasp. So um, and that's because they mimic what they look like, so they don't get attacked as much. A lot of hoverflies do, at least not all of them, but they are called also flowerflies, the Cirphidae. That's the family name. And they are great because a lot of their larvae, not all, but a lot of their larvae, like this one, um, they will go after aphids. So a lot of them are huge aphid uh, feeders. And they will literally seek out big colonies of aphids. And you could probably see this if you have like a place near you where, where you have weeds and they get a bunch of aphids. You might find some of these hoverflies and they lay some eggs the eggs hatch and you have the larvae that kind of look like a maggot a lot of people will mistake them for caterpillars they look like caterpillars to people so they'll kill them not knowing that they're actually an ally but they're really great and you can tell that's a hoverfly because they well they hover kind of like a hummingbird so that's how you can tell the difference so cool um so i uh <laughs> I had to finish my plants off in my garage this year. Garage filled with bees. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, bees. it was kind. Of, yeah, it was kind of cool to see, like, because it's also like seventeen Fahrenheit where I'm at, right? So, like, I had the garage door open just a little bit, but uh, it it did warm up, thank God, and they did leave. But it was just the coolest thing I've ever seen before, because. You know, I know, I know that they'll pollinate the plant, but I've never actually experienced that many bees. Like, you know, <laughs> did everything else. Like honeycomb? Like, did you have no, like a comb no, that they get removed? No. Oh, okay, okay. No, it was like, like a swarm. A three, yeah, it was like a three or four hour thing. So it was. It oh, was oh, yeah. So they, so they found your garage, and they were like, "Well, this hey, place is warmer plant. than like, uh, yeah." <laughs> and it's oh, got a living plant. plant yeah <laughs> yeah okay oh yeah it was the dangers of growing marijuana because like i'm super allergic to those things so yeah yeah i had a i had a, a person i worked for the president of the company um i remember he is a pretty great guy he was like not um he was he was a uh, well fit and everything he got stung and um i guess because he was older um, but he had like a sensitivity, so like it, it got a little bit like a problem. Do you get like a really strong reaction? Um, it's um, been a while since uh, I've had one. Like, I don't want to date myself, but like, so when I was four, uh, I reacted really bad, and uh, so I had to go through all those allergy tests and stuff, right? And it came mm -hmm. out that uh, bees, wasps, hornets that's like where they need to get me to a hospital EpiPen then to the hospital so okay, knock yeah, on so knock on fun. wood like I just I, I was raised to be afraid of you you'll die <laughs> so thanks mom shout shout out mom yeah but that's an example like I'm sure maybe you were cringing a little bit then when I was talking about the paper wasps the last time we spoke and it's like no yeah, if I would let you be here yeah, but I mean if you're in that situation that's totally I mean, that's a way different situation. Right? Like, you legit, you should have heard me, like, come into the house and start going to my family. There's bees. There's bees. Get them out. Get them out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I'm a total wimp. And, like, I'll, yeah, I'll own it. I'll no, own it's it. not It's not the same thing. I think uh, everyone would have that reaction if it was a rattlesnake. Because uh, well, that's your reaction. is like cool. a significant envenomation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's cool, not wimpy though. at all. 
No. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Although I have to ask you, um, do you have the same? Do you ever get stung by like a an ant or anything like that? Like a like a fire ant? Yeah. You ever? Yep. Yeah. And, and yeah. how's that for you? No problem. Everybody else is crying, and I'm like, it just kind of feels like a little tiny mosquito bite. Like just, that's really like, interesting because yeah. you know ants are wasps. They're oh, derived they, from. They look wasp like lineage. wasps, just no wings. Yeah, they're wasps that lost their wings. Essentially. Yeah, fuck you, ants. <laughs> <laughs> But that's no interesting because it looks like because the venom is different enough. That's really interesting to me. Huh? Okay. Okay. Well, maybe if that's the thing. Maybe this is all just cooked up <laughs> so that my parents could control me. <laughs> oh well. Only one way to find out. Know. Yeah. I'll pass. Hard no. Um, no, let's not do that. Yeah. 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 Let's get damn and sick. Ah, uh, there was one here. Yeah, these things. What on earth? Oh, nobody can see. Sorry. Oh, that's what they. Okay. Uh, there we go. Explain russet mites. Yeah, like right. Like what can be said that if you don't know what russet mites are, then you're in luck because I have a whole lot of content on it. Why do I have a whole lot of content on it? Because they're really damaging uh, to plants. First thing I want to say about them right off the bat uh, is that russet mites tend to be specialists. So if you're if you're dealing with cannabis, you're dealing with the hemp russet mite. Um, and, you're, and although there are species that are closely related, and there are sometimes exceptions to what I'm about to say, by and large, they are specialists. So you won't get like another russet mite getting onto your plant and, and being able to exist or sustain itself on it. But that's probably no simple comfort because even despite that, these russet mites get everywhere. A big way they get onto your plants is actually through the wind. So they'll, they'll, they have to reproduce on their host. And then they, uh, they're they so small that the breeze can pick them up into the air and they can go great distances. And we see this with like other russet mite species like uh, in wheat and that kind of thing. And the damage that they cause is the significant curling because they have compounds in their saliva that basically gnarl the tissue. It causes some sort of extreme localized like immune response. And they use that against the plant so that they can create kind of like a quasi shelter. Some species even go and make like blister galls and things. If you've ever seen like on oak, for example, um, and other plants like maple and that sort of thing. Uh, any arborists in the in the house will probably know some examples of this. And it doesn't really cause too much damage for the plant, but it's kind of unsightly. So yeah, russet mites and cannabis a huge issue. How do I deal with them? Uh, that wettable sulfur is really great in veg. Obviously, crop scouting is really important. And if you do come across them, um, if you have a large enough grow, you know, don't incriminate yourselves in the chat, but. Uh, <laughs> you do have a large enough grow that's a it's significant uh that you, maybe you have some helpers or something then you're going to be careful you want to like quarantine that space cordon it off and do whatever you're going to do away from those infected plants mark them and then treat them um this is also uh i like to use predatory mites for these as well it's a little bit contentious uh, right now in the um in the agricultural space i mean there's examples of Russet mites being affected by other predatory mites that are commercially available, like Coomers and Swirskii, and certainly in my experience, this has also been the case. Um, but it seems like some other people have had not the same experience. So it could be that maybe some cultures of predatory mites do better than others, certain species. It could be that there are other factors at play. So um, I would encourage people to, to look out for new information and research regarding but they're my favorite way to get rid of them is predatory mites. And as far as like sprays and things like that, um, you could use something like azadiractin potentially. Um, but there, but again, you got to be careful with how you implement that. Again, I wouldn't really apply that in flower. But uh, yeah, so russet mites. There's, I have a huge russet mite video on my channel uh, that I spend a lot of time on just getting all this information. So it's like a you know master russet mite uh, guide. So it doesn't just go after hemp russet mite it talks about all kinds of other ones and um, yeah I, I like to make my stuff based on research so that you know that 
coming from somewhere. It's not just some guy saying, don't worry, just do this and you'll be fine. I just feel like people get burned that way. You know, I, you know, I, I love your candor and how, how honest you are. So the reason why I don't know this stuff is because I know you. <laughs> and that's plain and simple, <laughs> right? Like, and I need help with a mechanic, right? I don't I know yeah. something about cars. But if I have a trouble, yeah. I'm going to go to it. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's well. And like, really, I knock on wood. I haven't had to work with biologicals, right? Like I use ladybugs. I use praying mantis, lace wings, right? Like I, I'm a huge fan of predatory insects. So I've never had full blown problems where I've had to start introducing biologicals. And it's the, the other part of it is, is I would go to a professional and get a hold of somebody that knows like, how do I deal with this without, you know, discrediting quality, you know, not really well ending the problem, but can you really ever end it? Well, yeah, you can start over, but you're still exposed to those problems. Anyway, we're the other thing I love about Future Cameras Project are all the questions people have. So, uh, first we've got: Do Russet live in the petiole? Yeah. So, for those who don't know, the petiole of a plant. Petiole. Is the, no, that's petiole. Probably petiole is probably probably. Petiole. It's more you know correct. what, Doctor Doctor Schwabi picks on me because she's like, you always say words wrong. I was like, do I care? <laughs> I, I'll you probably you might know this already about me, but I'm I'm a little bit of a, a persnickety person when it comes to words. I like to get them right, but it's totally for myself and for like good communication. But if but I know what people are saying. You know, I know my box, man. Them. I know my I know my box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like uh, I do it so, for fun too. Like legitimately, there's not there are words that like because with the dank hour we've got inside jokes, so I'll just butcher the word on purpose, and everybody's got to keep a straight face. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. I remember, I remember in English class one time, I had a teacher who was like, they would use antith, they would say antithesis, but they said okay. antithesis. Antithesis. <laughs> antithesis. Yeah, that, that yeah, always took yeah. my mind. <laughs> But uh, to answer the question, the petiole okay, yeah. is the is the it's the uh, section of leaf that is attached to like the stem of the plant, right? Uh, so there's like the leaf part, and then there's the attaching part, and that's the petiole. And uh, something that a lot of people have said over time is that people say people are worried that russet mites will feed on the petiole, or they'll be inside the plant. Like, do they burrow into the plants? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's the purple right. That, thing. That, that purple part, right? That's the yeah. petiole. Yeah, petiole. So, <laughs> yeah. So they, so people have said this before. People have made this this comment. I think, uh, I think it stems from the idea that they're so they can be hard to like see at first before they start damaging your plant, which is pretty soon after they get in there. But no, no, I don't think so. I don't. Not for hemp russet mite. There are russet mites in my video. I go over one that is in um, uh, grass, grasses that goes and feed and actually will burrow into like the leaf margin. But I don't think that's very common for russet mites to do something like that, least of all the hemp russet mite, as far as I know. And there's a lot more research to be done for hemp russet mite. Um, I think also another one that people ask a lot is like, do they burrow into the seed? Can they get into the seeds? Um, you know, if I like, if I have a plant and I'm trying to breed with it and the rest of my on the flower, like, are they going to like get into the hull of the seed or can they burrow into the hull? I'm here to say that, uh, that's probably not the case. Uh, the hull of the seed is so hard. Their, 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 uh, stylet is very weak in comparison. In fact, one of the things that keeps rest of mites from being so more adaptable is that their bodies are actually kind of, um, they're super minimalist. Their genome is really small and they don't have a whole lot going on. And what they can do is what they do very well. And that's pretty much it. And so that's mostly feeding on the top layer of the plant. And as you can see, they even need a handicap. They have to like mess with the immune system uh, in order for them to feed on it. And so yeah, so the mites are not very robust. The, sty the stylus? The stylus, the, their stylus, proboscis, that... Yeah. Yeah, they're feeding. They're, it's like a feeding tube. Oh, a feeding yeah, tube. yeah. Okay, okay, cool. 
Okay, next question. Root knot nematodes, do we need steam to kill? We get a, we got a question like that last time, and, and do you need steam to kill them? wildfire. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it can't, maybe. Um, I am assuming that they mean, like, do we need to steam sterilize our soil before we use it? I wouldn't really recommend doing it when plants are in the soil. I'm not sure how you do that, too, but uh, <laughs> just in case. Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of people find that root knot nematodes are so, and also root lesion nematodes and other similar kinds of nematodes are so difficult to deal with that that's pretty much like that or solarization or something like this, which admittedly is kind of a, a nuclear strike. It's kind of a, a, a broad spectrum control because they're so difficult to deal with. And I'm not... You know, I'm not privy to uh, something that's some magical solution for a lot of people in the field or in beds. This can be a real big deal breaker. And I think also, especially for people who are dealing with like where the, the soil microbiome is very, very much like in the foreground of how they're guiding their plant growth. They don't want to like, they don't want to go through all this work and then have to you know, dispose of their soil or their, or, or turn up their field or till it or things like that. So some sort of preventive measure, if you know you're going to get them, if you've already gotten them um, and your location hasn't changed or anything like that, it's probably the case. Because they'll also come in, even if you treat all of that, that's the problem, is that if you're in the field, they're going to come from other places. They, that's how, you know, they spread that way. So it's a really unfortunate like reality. And I don't really have... I don't really have an answer besides that. But so yes, the answer is probably yes, if that's your situation. Next question. Are the mites indiscriminate eaters or do they attack weak, dry plants? If they mean, so I don't know, mites are huge. Uh, if they mean russet mites, then they're, they kind of aren't huge. Cho they're not very choosy because like to, to paint a picture about russet mites, they basically... They're blind. They so they can't see, uh, and of the senses that they do have, mostly it's like, is this food or not? It's being able to sense the volatiles somewhat, and then feeding on the plant, and hopefully, you know, being able. And but because they're specialists, right? That gives them that's their edge. Is that if they've they've evolved and adapted on the plant that they have. And when their host, you know, if, as their hosts spread over evolutionary time, then those plants become different species. And sure enough, russet mites follow that trend too. So they develop with their, their host. So they are able to feed on a plant pretty well, if it's, if that's, especially if it's their host. So they don't really have a whole lot of like options when it comes to spreading, right? It's a lot of it's passive. It's either wind dispersal or dispersal on animals or dispersal on like dead material or they'll like oh, they'll overwinter um in the in the in the uh the the matter the, the leaf matter that's fallen away the follow in the follow fields or whatever and so when the new plants germinate like in the wild as this usually happens right it'll be in the same place more or less and so then the new population will come and follow that so they don't really get to choose very much. So I don't really, I wouldn't really say that they have like a preference, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, moving on to, uh, how do we get back to your Instagram? There we go. <laughs> what type of, this, so this is a spider mite. No, that's a predatory mite. Yeah, you got it right. That's right. They're a predatory mite of some kind, some way, shape, or form. Yeah, that's from the from my Discord, from my Patreon Discord. So if you want a back, if you want a back of the pocket IPM specialist, you can join that for as little as one dollar a month. I I want people to have this information as much as possible. Um, yeah. So there are other higher tiers. If you would like uh, to like dictate a video to me or something like that, you could check that out. But yeah, um, somebody sent that in our Discord, and we were able to talk about it. So a lot of people sent me some really cool videos, like this one that you've chosen. This one? Yeah. Maybe you'll empathize uh, a little bit more with spiders. 
I don't mind spiders. They're pretty. Oh, that's cool. good. Yeah, but not spider mites. <laughs> don't no. like spider mites. No, 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 yeah. <laughs> no. It looks no. like uh, some spiders, like this jumping spider. Basically, the cliff notes is that they dream, maybe, or they have they have uh, involuntary actions that are very similar. And also the neurological impulses are very similar to when people move and sleep and other animals. So maybe there's something there. You know, I I think everything's got a relationship. Something, something and I, there, and, yeah. And I feel like relationships like is spirit, right? Just to kind of condense it, but I also feel like my worldview doesn't matter to anybody else but me, and I'm not going to force it upon somebody. But that's my TED Talk on that. I want to move to this question, which is great. Thank you, South Bay Genetics. Um, can you talk about, I don't know what that word is or that word, yeah. which is a fungus-eating ladybug powdery mildew? Yeah, so that's uh, <laughs> Tylobora uh, viginta maculata or okay. viginta or widget widget maculata if you were going with the old old latin pronunciation right there are v's were w's as some would say it's not caesar but kaiser some would say or, or kaiser anyways um yeah i have to really justify that one or two latin courses that i took uh, in college right <laughs> but uh <laughs> silabora so yeah. So this is, yes, this is a lady beetle that I like to talk about because it feeds on not just fungus, but powdery mildew in particular, uh, mostly as larvae, like I said last time. And I probably have, I bet if you were to search the Silabora hashtag on Instagram, you'd probably find a video of mine on Instagram or on YouTube, whatever would be easier for you if you want to put up a visual. Yeah, but they're pretty cool. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, youtube.com slash channels. Oh, hey, no, I can just go right here. YouTube channel. And uh, yeah, so some things to talk about for them is that they're kind of small. They have like a black and white coloration. So they don't look like other lady beetles. I mean, they do generally, but most people associate lady beetles with like a... a a black polka dotted red bodied uh you know beetle and they're a little bit larger but these ones are somewhat smaller and a lot of people know what lady beetles look like but they don't know what the larvae look like sometimes referred to as little alligators there's that rest of my video but yeah i think in my playlist if you go to the playlists yeah you might find you might find a Halzeany or the Coxinility. Yeah, there you go. Coxinility, the lady, lady bird beetles. Oh, no. It's in the okay. center. Down no. or right and then right more. There you go. And then, yeah, so this is so this is a video about, the, about a, a group of fungivorous lady beetles in general. But if you go to that next video, you'll have a better visual for everyone. The next one right below it? Yeah. So, so they have this like mottled gray and, and black coloration. And some studies have shown, because uh, wouldn't it be great to get like a powdery mildew biocontrol that like you can actually see and sort of quantify rather than a microbial one that, well, while that's fine and everything, you know, um, it's a little bit harder to quantify somewhat. They... Uh, but some research has definitely shown that they can impact powdery mildew populations. The the downside, though, is that, and I've had talks with people who do this kind of research, and I, I, I'm not against the possibility, but it does seem like they, that's a really good shot, yeah. So I took this video um, with, a, with a camera that is even less capable than the one I have now on my phone. I'm pretty happy with how it came out. But... These uh, beetles, they probably also track the spores of the powdery mildew with them as they're moving. <laughs> so in that way, they guarantee that there's a food source. Now, a lot of people asking with biocontrols are like, Matt, 
if I if you use like a biocontrol, doesn't it like know that it will eat all of its food and so it keeps them around? No, it doesn't. They don't have that kind of cognition as far as we can tell. A lot of times they don't even have the eyesight to really figure that out, much less the foresight to think about it. But um, it is true in some cases, like in this, where some organisms do have less kind of like symbiotic relationship with their food. This is kind of like growing your own food, right? Like growing your own crop of mycelium for yourself. So as you eat it, you also pass it along. But um, hopefully there might be a way to use them in a really good way. And I think this video might also have a research report, the research report section on it in the, in the, at the end. I'm not totally sure. Uh, but yeah, it, it was cool. It was cool to see the, um, the, re the research looking into it for new, creative, insightful ways to deal with powdery mildew. So if South Bay has any other questions about them, I'd happily uh, entertain them. And but yeah. no, there's no research at the end. <laughs> nope, looks like it's not. Okay, Anyways. what else is it? Your YouTube's gold, dude. <laughs> yeah, we should do more of these for sure. Uh, there's all kinds of cool videos uh, uh, collected over time. Ooh. Rove Beatles. Uh, I'll look at Steam uh, ad while we're on Steam. We'll, or, um, we'll just, on we'll just Steam, talk uh, for a second while that go plays through. Yeah, why don't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, well, you 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 selected a cool video. This was um, this video is from a research report that looked at uh, rove beetles because one cool thing about them is that the Staphylinidae, the family of rove beetles, is actually really old as far as insect families go. A lot of people don't know this, but beetles are one of the most diverse orders of insects and one of the most successful if you consider how many different species there are and all the different ecolog ecological niches they are in. So they've adapted to all kinds of things. But the ones that most people are worried about here are the ones that are in the soil that are predatory. Not all rove beetles are like this, but like Delosia, uh, which is like the greenhouse rove beetle, like this one. Uh, they are like this. They have this sort of slender body. They don't have like a body like a lady beetle does, which is kind of much more rigid and rotund. These ones have to snake through the soil to find their food. And what makes rove beetles very unique is that they have um, the most unique way to fold their wings. And so the, the researchers wanted to find out how they go about folding their wings back up into what are called the elytra or the wing covers. Basically a long time ago, there you can see um, the movement. So they actually use their abdomen to fold the wing over itself. And they do this <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Right? <laughs> oh, sorry, man. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, I want it like it feels like it should be, uh, you know, like viewed with a little bit of reverence somewhat. But yeah, so the, the front wings are the wing covers. So a long time ago, beetles and other insects, well, in this case, beetles, those two extra wings became a hardened shell. And then the other two are the flying wings. So, yeah. And so, like, we're only road beetles do that. OK, just wait here. I got to pause this. I got questions. Yeah. Why is it packing its wings up like that? Like, is it a defense mechanism or like, it's just like, no, I don't need my wings right now. So let's, you know. Yeah, basically, like if you look at other beetles, they do the same thing. They have that hard, that hard covering. Those used to be wings a long time ago, but beetles evolved or the ancestor of all beetles basically had uh, this sort of hardening of the first pair of wings. And so that probably allowed them to be much more defended against problems. And yeah, like people are saying, obviously being able, so not only going, doing that, but being more further, more compact, uh, having the elytra being much more compact, that has allowed them to have all these very benefits, like not getting snagged on, on uh, soil litter. That's a good point that somebody uh, pointed out in the chat. Um, they don't get caught 
and they're able to just kind of snake their way into the soil. So, so yeah, they don't need it. And so, and, and wings can get damaged pretty easily, uh, particularly in this environment. So, well, yeah, yeah cause to see them and how they're, how, where they crease, like I was expecting it to break seeing that. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. That's really gnarly. Yeah, and if you want to see some cool diagrams, you can check out. I think I have the research report in the description. That might be the case. Maybe not. Sometimes I do not do that. Oh, I didn't yeah. do it this time. No, but I do SoundCloud. think I referenced it. In the, <laughs> yeah, but you can check out my SoundCloud if you want. I do make music sometimes, but nice. it's sort of ambient. If you're into ambient music, uh, you know, chill wave. I've had some people call it... Um, Oh, what was the term they used? <laughs> it was actually kind of a cool ter uh, term, but I, I forget now. Oh, well, anyways, you can you can check it out. Well, um, just just let's talk about this for a second. What digital sure. audio writer, are you, like what software are you using? Oh, just free stuff like LMS. Yeah. Oh, cool. I don't cool, have man. I don't have a or well, um, I don't use like. Um, Oh, what was it? I was trying to use one time. I forget. But uh, like free loops or any of that stuff. Yeah, uh, Ableton or Ableton. Yeah. There's a few of them out there. No, that's cool, man. <laughs> like I'm, I'm a huge fan of art and stuff, right? So the uh, more the better. Um, let me pick another one here. And then you still got like 15 minutes, right? I'd say that I have about... I have about like five or six minutes. So you got questions, we can lightning round it or I can okay. check out a video or two. Yeah, let's uh we'll grab one more video. And then if anybody's got questions, please get them in. I'll pick a short one. Um random. Do you do no do you do shorts? Yeah, you do. Okay. Okay, I got one. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> So here's a lacewing video. Uh, this is a green lacewing that's hatching out of its egg. If you've never seen them before, um, lacewing eggs, they're like these little, as you can see, white sort of oblong shapes that are deposited on a pedicle, uh, which is like a hair structure that the lacewing adult makes when they're uh, producing the egg. So they produce the, the hair it's not really hair. It's more like a structure that looks like a hair. And then they deposit the egg on top. This is done primarily, it's thought, because it keeps the egg protected from like maybe a predatory mite or something that's scavenging the foliage for some easy to eat food. And maybe it has some other secondary or tertiary effects. But yeah, here's a little uh, lacewing larva evolving. Uh, not evolving. It was a Pokemon term. But it's a... Um, it's, yeah, I know, right? Uh, even, you know, that's 10 years, 20, 10 years of propaganda as a kid, right? You got to get that terminology out. But you can see that it is uh, sort of developing right outside the egg. And lace wings are actually another really ancient group of insects. They have a lot of traits that show that off, mostly because unlike the beetles we just saw, they don't fold their wings at all. Um, so having like a net wing shape that is rigid like a dragonfly's is something that early insects developed and then other ones developed all these fancy ways to fold them that's awesome excuse me um the best is is when i'm working with a new farmer and they come and they go these trichomes and i burst out laughing <laughs> no, yeah. no. <laughs> I, yeah i wish like could you imagine a trichome that big so it's oh, yeah. Uh, yeah new growers please don't be confused it's not a trichome but they are a beneficial and you don't want yeah. to necessarily kill it you know um so if any we've got one question here i don't know if uh noah 420 dabber 710 is serious um so we are in a situation of honey i shrunk the basement growers then st stuck in our grows trying to get big again can we fight off the mites or are we doomed 
It's going to depend on what mites, but probably in both cases, the answer is yes. But like yeah. how, uh, you know, the questions I would ask is how many mites are you seeing? How many plants do you have? Things like this. If they're spider mites, I would say they're a lot easier than russet mites, generally speaking. Yep. How far and, away is Rick, Rick Moranis to make you big again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's tough when you don't have a whole lot of uh, resources or, you know, like in a home growth situation too, you're, you're bouncing around, you have your, other, your whole life that you're trying to do as well. And then suddenly there's a problem. And now you have to find a solution quickly. And every day that you wait, every hour that you wait, things get difficult. Not to, you know, not to, not to alarm anyone. But I think yeah. you can do it. I think you can do it. I'm knocking on wood, dude. <laughs> yeah, watch, I watch my video. I don't need any problems. <laughs> Benefits of hypoaspisus mites. Yeah. Yeah. Hypoaspis or, or stradiolalaps. Yeah, so big benefit would be, the major benefit really, is that they go after soil microarthropods. So like the springtails I mentioned, like the mold mice I mentioned, they'll, have to go, they'll also go after those, thrip, those quiescent thrip stages and things like that. So that's what you would use them for generally. Um, some people have advertised using them for like rice root aphid. I've never experienced that to be the case, and I, I'm i pretty confident in saying that I'm dubious about any efficacy related to that. So if anyone has like evidence to the contrary, I would love to add that to my repertoire, but I don't think that that's really going to be the case. So if you've been told that, um, maybe save your money, try a different strategy. Nice. Okay. So now I've just got like two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, is I don't, and I've never asked you this, but where did you go to school? Went to San Diego State University. Okay. Okay. And you st study bugs, ethnomology, right? Actually, I, I did not study entomology. entomology. I didn't get a degree in entomology. I took no. entomology courses, okay. but I didn't go in. I actually did not uh, get a degree in entomology. And the reason for this is mainly because, well, first of all, at that time in my life, I wanted to maybe join the U.S. Army. So I had different priorities in college in the very beginning. But the other reason is because although I really liked that field, uh, it's uh, I know from I know from friends and colleagues that it's a tough and basically you there's a romanticism about um entomological research or really any kind of research if you, like you don't get to choose what you do research on a lot of the time a lot of the time you don't really get to choose and basically if i want to make any sort of sustainable income i would basically have to become like a i saw that i really only had one outlook and that was like some sort of ag chem entomologist i didn't really want to do that kind of research so that's the main reason yeah but i did take entomology courses i got a degree in horticultural science and that still didn't make me any less passionate about insects and also other organisms that people deal with both the bad ones and the good ones awesome and lastly, standard question, where can we find you? What are you up to next? You can find me at xenthanol.com for professional inquiries. You can also find me on Instagram, also on X or Twitter, right? Uh, at Sync Angel for both of those accounts. You can also find me on my Patreon. I'm making more videos and hopefully... Um, if you have questions and you don't have access in other ways, you could join my Patreon and you can get access to my Discord where there's a community of like, I want to say about 140 people or so, give or take, that are also interested in IPM and also are growers. And there's a nice community of people who will help you out if you have a problem. And of course, myself, I'll also come and help you out. Just got to tag me in the chat. And... I get a lot of cool uh, questions from there too. So Patreon, YouTube, Zenthanol for all the cool videos that are where most of my content is and also Instagram and Twitter and Zenthanol.com. Awesome. Well, Matt, I, uh, I love hanging out with you and uh, I really enjoy learning from you. 
Um, I mean this in the nicest way possible, but I hope I never have to use you professionally. <laughs> I make that joke all the time. Yeah, uh, okay, honestly, good. I, I good. agree I'm with so you. Sorry. It's so lowbrow. I'm sorry. I it's my help, but I'm yeah. A dad. Well, <laughs> what can I say? I'm a. I'm a. I'm. I'm into the self-deprecation jokes too. So it's okay. I'm the same way. Yeah. I hope you never need to use me. I hope you never have to ask a question. And you know. And that's why I make all that content for free because even people who are my clients will be like, oh man, well, we, we tried all this stuff and it's still not working. In my opinion, if your business plan is not better than a Google search, then you have a bad business plan. So as far as I'm concerned, don't make the information hard to find. You know? It comes down to a lot of other things, right? You know, I know how to change yeah. the oil on my car, but I am not changing the oil on my car. Somebody else can do that. <laughs> Anyway, on that sure. note, Future Cannabis family, it's been a blast. Um, thank you to Chad Westport. Thank you to Peter. Thank you to Dirty. Thank you to, oh, there were so many of you, uh, all the questions. Um, London and Tank Hours got a really big episode coming up on November 6th. Uh, da, 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 da. There's stuff going on this weekend on the channel, so we'll see everybody later. It's really hard to keep up. And I'm going to end the stream.